Howdy movie buffers! So it goes without saying that this particular video would have been much better suited for October, but you know, as the saying goes, better late than never. So I quite enjoy the first couple of Hellraiser films, and while the later direct-to-video sequels get a little bit messy and the franchise is definitely a roller coaster of ups and downs, they will always hold a special place in my heart, even the bad ones. As you can probably guess, based off of my shirt, I am a humongous Hellraiser fan, um, as well as a big fan of Pinhead, Doug Bradley, and Clive Barker in general. Actually, as a matter of fact, last year I cosplayed as Pinhead when I went to MegaCon in Orlando. Anyway, this all kind of brings me down to today's video, which is actually an partial, the keyword is partial, defense of Hellraiser 3 Hell on Earth, released in 1992. Arguably the most Pinhead-centered movie out of the entire franchise, except maybe Bloodline. Um, but that's a story for another time. This is one that, you know, it gets very mixed reviews. It's sort of the black sheep of the franchise. People, you know, they either really like it or they really hate it. Uh, personally, I've always quite enjoyed this one, um, despite the complaints. And um, believe me, a lot of the complaints are definitely valid. That's why the title of this video is an partial defense of Hellraiser 3. Because many of these things that, you know, people point out, many of these flaws, I do agree on. But maybe not to the extent that those people do, or the experience of the film isn't ruined just because of those things. I can kind of overlook the not-so-great acting, the, the kind of messy storytelling um, and dialogue that's in this film. Because at the end of the day, I do think this is a rather underrated movie, and I don't think it's bad. Uh, that's the main thing. It's got its problems, but this is far from the worst of the Hellraiser franchise, at least in my opinion. And I do think this film is a bit underrated. You know, there is some good stuff here. There is a lot of good Hellraiser lore, and it does add something of value to the franchise. Because while this movie does have its problems, like I said, it adds enough to the lore to make it feel like a Hellraiser film. Again, this is my opinion. If you disagree, you absolutely are allowed to do so. Just give it my two cents on why I like this film. Um, and if nothing else, this is a very fun movie. It is an entertaining movie. It gets a little cheesy, a little campy in the third act with some of the other Cenobites that get brought in. But I mean, it's it's fun if you're able to kind of look past those things. I guess the main difference for me um, compared to a lot of the um, the fan base that tend to not really like this one is that I'm, I'm able to look past those things and, and they don't really bring down the, the fun, the enjoyment of the movie for me too much. I can acknowledge that they're there, but they just don't bug me. Because at the end of the day, I can put those scenes aside and still have a great time with this film. And it is a really fun time, especially when you get to the third act. The original film was released in 1987 and was written and directed by horror writer Clive Barker, whom had written the novella The Hellbound Heart, which this first movie was based off of. The film does make a few changes to the storyline, but overall follows the source material fairly close. It was a new and refreshing take on the horror genre, favoring a slow burn and a gothic tone rather than a hack 'em up slasher type of film. While the film without a doubt has its terrifying visuals and gruesome moments, the focus here is much more on the story and characters as opposed to just having a body count. Being shot in England, as well as being composed of a cast and crew mostly of British origin, Hellraiser marks a very important landmark in British-American horror. The sequel, Hellbound Hellraiser 2, was released only a year later and does a great job expanding on the concepts and characters that were introduced to us in the first movie. Although Barker would not direct this time around, given the spotlight instead to Tony Randall, 
with Barker closely supervising the production. The first two Hellraiser movies have a very unique and original feel to them, and it's also important when looking at a film like this to take into account not only the time period in which they were made, but as well as what other types of horror films were popular around this time. By the time Hellraiser came around, the slasher craze was at its biggest. Friday the 13th had released its sixth entry the year before Hellraiser was released, A Nightmare on Elm Street would release its third entry that same year in 1987, and both Child's Play and Halloween 4 would be released the following year. So it's easy to see what types of horror films were currently trending at the time. Then along comes this movie, which features a man in a leather S&M outfit holding a puzzle box and whose face looks like a literal pincushion. I'm sure that when many folks saw this poster in theaters back in 87, a lot of them probably assumed it was going to be a new upcoming slasher film. However, things could not be any different, as Hellraiser takes a very mature approach to the horror formula in that it doesn't feature horny co-eds getting stalked and slashed by a demented psycho or boogeyman type character. It was a very refreshing take on the horror genre, though I'm sure folks who were expecting another slasher movie probably left this one a tad disappointed and confused. On top of this, the character featured on the poster, known nowadays by fans as Pinhead, although he technically did not have a name in the original film, is only really in the movie for a total of 10 minutes, and serves as more of a background character slash secondary antagonist, rather than being the movie's main driving force. The story itself is very self-contained and mainly takes place inside of this one house. Hellraiser 2, while being a bit grander and more ambitious in that it not only took us through the gates of hell, but also developed many of the previous film's characters even more, including Pinhead and his Cenobite minions. However, the story was still largely not focused on them, and while they did have significantly more screen time than the original movie, again they were still more so background characters. The third entry of the series, Hellraiser 3 Hell on Earth, would be the film to not only make Pinhead a horror icon, but would introduce Hellraiser as a franchise to American audiences as well. The first two entries were moderately successful and did receive a limited theatrical release in the United States. However, the franchise was still relatively unknown to mainstream horror audiences until this third entry. Released in 1992, this was the first film in the franchise to be distributed by Miramax and Dimension Studios, rather than New World Pictures which had done the first two films. This studio had actually gone bankrupt shortly after the second Hellraiser film was released. Clive Barker was not as involved with this one, although he did still have some involvement with the script and production, hence why his name does appear in the opening titles. Anthony Hickox would direct this time around, having recently directed the horror comedy film Waxwork and its sequel. The only cast member to return from the previous two entries was Doug Bradley, who really does seem to be having a lot of fun in this role. There is a quote special appearance by Ashley Lawrence as Kirsty, the heroine from the first two movies, however I can hardly even count her appearance as a cameo because it's basically just a two minute long confession of some super pixelated footage that was supposed to have been taken during her time in the Chouinard Institute from Hellraiser 2. Unfortunately, Bradley basically acts laps around the rest of the cast, including our lead, Joey, played by Terry Farrell, who would actually end up being a rather prolific TV actress starring in Star Trek Deep Space Nine, amongst other things. I can cut her a little slack as this was one of her first roles in anything film related, and it definitely shows here because her performance is, well, not the greatest. Then again, Ashley Lawrence's performance was a little rough around the edges, particularly in the first Hellraiser movie. And I know that some fans have an issue with the idea of Pinhead and the Cenobites being the main villains and the driving force of this film since that was never the case with the first two movies. And while I certainly appreciate the more gothic approach that those movies took, as opposed to being a bit more of a slasher like this one did, I don't think it's doing much harm really to have one movie 
that is centered around the Pinhead slash Elliot Spencer character. Because I don't know about you guys, but I, I did find the snippet that we got in Hellraiser 2 um, of Pinhead's origin to be very intriguing and very fascinating. And I wanted to learn more about that. Now I know there's the element of mystery and maybe not everything needs to be explained in a franchise. I get that. I will acknowledge that. But I didn't mind seeing it in this film. Because really, if you think about it, this is the only movie that centers around Pinhead as the main villain, as the main driving force. He gets a very large role in the next film, Bloodline, as well. But you kind of have another main villain in that movie as well. I'm not going to spoil it too much and go into names or details because I might review that film later on. But you have another main villainous character in that movie that kind of arguably is, is the main villain. Whereas Pinhead's more of the secondary antagonist, although you could very well say the opposite because it's a pretty close amount of screen time that these two characters get together. So after Hell on Earth, you know, Bloodline is easily the most Pinhead you see in any of the Hellraiser films. But again, in this one, he is the driving force. He is the title, you know, character for all intents and purposes. I mean, he gets second villain after Terry Farrell. So that just goes to show you that this movie was really designed to kind of cater to the Pinhead fans, to the ones that looked at those first two movies and said, oh, that guy was really cool. That was a really interesting character. I want to learn more about him. Hell on Earth takes place four years after the events of Hellbound in New York City this time, despite being filmed in North Carolina, where we see the pillar from the end of the last movie being purchased by this douchey nightclub owner, J.P. Monroe, played by Kevin Bernhardt, and his even douchier looking haircut. Of course, who should show up to sell him the pillar but another homeless vagrant? I'm guessing this is supposed to be the same vagrant we saw in the first movie who was eating all the bugs, but it's never specified. He's also played by a different actor this time around, Lawrence Mortorf, who actually happens to be one of the producers of this movie. JP decides that the pillar would make an excellent piece of artwork for his nightclub, and as he hands over the cash, the bum gives him some wise words. Take pleasure in it. Next, we cut to a hospital room where we meet our hero for the film, Joey, played by Terry Farrell. She's a reporter who's given a report on... I don't even know what, to be honest. This is Joey Summerskill for Channel 8, Emergency Room. Very bored. No story, no life. Oh, okay, there we go. Nothing. We also meet her cameraman, Doc, who is rocking that handlebar mustache, by the way. And also sounds like he's dubbed for some reason. Yeah, well, like you said, it's a mystery. But that's all it is, a mystery. During this whole sequence, we keep cutting back to this nurse who is wearing a very obvious wig and is for some reason very slowly and very creepily laying out all these surgical tools out on the table, including a bone saw, which she then caresses. I guess we're just sticking with the theme from the first two Hellraiser movies where all the human characters are just as creepy as the demonic ones. So Joey walks out into the hallway in what is one of the creepiest and most poorly lit hospitals I think I've ever seen. But don't worry, things are about to liven up a lot. Have you ever seen anything like this before? Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Wait, what? This just happens all the time? Oh my god, you ever seen a guy with chains hanging out of his body like this, man? Yeah, yeah, sure, all the time. Wait, what? The fuck kind of hospital do you work at? Well, we've definitely seen those chains before. Wait! Wait, please, I need to talk to you! I wasn't even with him. Look, lady, I told you, it's not my problem. I was just there, right? Where? The boiler room. Can I go now? The boiler room? What is the boiler room? Where is the boiler room? Okay, so does Joey's character have, like, ADHD or just really bad anxiety? I am by no means trying to be offensive to anyone out there, but I just have to wonder, because, I mean, who the hell talks like this? Oh, I was hanging out the other night with my boys at the boiler room, having some drinks and stuff, you know. What is the boiler room? Where is the boiler room? Why is the boiler room? 
But that's a question that's gonna have to wait for later because all of a sudden the room lights up and we see the chains suspended in the air pulling at the kid's skin with electricity crackling around them. And then the dude's head explodes. I know some folks have complained saying that they don't feel like it was really necessary to see the monitor flatline since the dude's head just exploded a second earlier, but I thought it was a nice little touch. Besides, he's perfectly fine. See, his head grew back in the next shot. And now it's time for a random jump scare. <laughs> this is also one of the few sequences that was actually shot in New York City. And then we get to see the Twin Towers as well, which is always interesting when watching an older film. Next, we cut to the Boiler Room nightclub, the club that JP owns, and we get to see Terry doing some investigative reporting. And you know, I do gotta say, after seeing the interior of this nightclub, this is definitely what I would imagine a nightclub would look like if it was ran by Clive Barker. We also meet the bartender, played by Peter Atkins, who wrote this film as well as the second and fourth Hellraiser movies. Can I help? Um, I'm looking for a pretty girl. JP Monroe, that way. And I gotta say, this is probably the widest variety of attire that I've ever seen in a nightclub. We have people wearing casual dress clothes, formal suits, people wearing tank tops, Polo shirts, t-shirts, and then we get people just completely shirtless. We also get to see this is a pretty rowdy nightclub. We also meet the DJ who helps point Joey in the right direction. She ends up in a bougie looking restaurant which I guess is like attached to the nightclub? I can't say I've ever come across that myself, but I guess stranger things have happened. It just seems weird that this trashy looking nightclub would have this nice of a restaurant attached to it. Like this bougie classical music is nice and all, but it doesn't really fit with the rowdy biker theme of the bar next door. Finally, she comes across JP, who's a little bit busy. He brushes her off when she tries to get some information out of him, and realizing she's wasting her time, she beats a hasty retreat, but not before JP tries to make a move on her. I don't think I'm your type. You see, I'm out of grade school. Next, we cut to the first of many dream sequences in this movie, which gets a little bit tiresome. So, Joey keeps having nightmares about her father that she never met, who was killed in Vietnam. And here, we get to really see how great of an actress she is. Don't worry, I was cringing a little bit too. Anyway, a phone call wakes her up and it turns out to be Terry, the girl who was at the nightclub, who was also the one we saw earlier at the hospital. Here we learn that her ex is none other than the oh-so-lovable JP Monroe, who has apparently given her the boot and she is now without a place to stay. She offers to give Joey the scoop on what happened to the kid before he was wheeled into the hospital, in exchange for a place to stay. Joey agrees, and the two bond over coffee and cigarettes. Here we learn that Terry is unable to dream, and wishes for nothing more than to be able to do so. So the two finally discuss what happened at the club prior to the incident at the hospital, and Terry basically beats around the bush this entire time. I mean, it gets a little bit annoying, honestly, because she keeps mentioning that it wasn't her fault, which, like, Nobody ever said it was, and it's not like Joey's the police, so it's not like she could really do anything about it, even if it was her fault, but... Whatever. Minor gripe, I'm nitpicking here. Turns out the kid stole the box, which was attached to the pillar that we saw in the art store at the beginning. After asking her where the chains came from, Terry presents her with an all-too-familiar object. In what is admittedly a pretty sick shot, I have to admit. He said it came out of this. He said it came out of this. Meanwhile, back at the club, we see JP chilling next to his statue when he hears a noise coming from it. 
Also, I should take this time to mention that JP is played by Kevin Bernhardt, who would actually go on to have quite a successful career as a screenwriter and producer. Looks like a chunk of the statue has been broken off, and since he's a smart person, JP decides to stick his hand directly into the hole that he hears a noise coming from. Some of JP's blood gets onto the statue and it immediately starts sizzling, as well as dripping in the direction of Pinhead's mouth. Jesus, this guy is like if Beavis and Butthead discovered the Lament configuration. Whoa, dude. Like, these hooks have embedded themselves in my skin and now they're ripping my flesh apart. Cool. <laughs> the next morning at Joey's apartment, Terry informs her that she got the statue from an art gallery. After hearing this, the two of them decided to do some more investigating. And, okay, I'm not the only one who seriously thought Joey was about to go in for a kiss here, am I? I know they were going for more of a sisterly kind of relationship here, but it 100% looked like that's what she was about to do. This turns out to be a dead end though, because the shop appears to be completely shut down. Not only this, but a bystander informs them both that the owner is in Hawaii and has been there for over a month at this point. After picking the lock, the two do some snooping and they come across some documents from the Chouinard Institute, you know, the asylum from Hellraiser 2 as well as some drawings of the puzzle box. Check it out. It's the box. <laughs> oh, why is that funny though? You should be traumatized after seeing that kid's head explode and then seeing a drawing of the thing that made said kid's head explode. Although I do appreciate them taking the time to explain how the pillar made its way from England all the way to the United States. Back at the club, it looks like JP has found his next booty call. Welcome. You're JP Monroe, right? That's right. And this is your club? Right again. Great club. I really love it here. Please, somebody, give this woman an Oscar. Next, we cut to the girl getting plowed by JP on his bed while he drips his cigarette ashes all over her body. Like, yeah, nothing says sexy like that. Also, we get to see that Pinhead is apparently a peepin' Tom. We cut back to Joey, who is seen looking over some old photos from the previous two movies of both Kirsty, Elliot Spencer, and the bloody bed from the second movie that brought Julia back to life. While this scene is not without purpose, and it does help to progress the plot as she is able to get her hands on the tape of Kirsty Cotton's confessions, this is where the film does drag a little bit and does start to feel a little bit dull. I do appreciate them having a little bit of build up and maybe trying to connect things that were established in the previous movies, but it just goes on for a little too long. And with only a runtime of 93 minutes long, Pinhead needs to wake the fuck up soon so we can get to the carnage already. So, in order to prove what a womanizing piece of shit he is, after banning her, JP gives the girl the boot and basically tells her to get the fuck out of his life, which she doesn't take very kindly to. Thankfully, this squealing rant is put to an end when she gets too close to the statue. You think you're some goddamn prince or something? <laughs> Alright, I know we're not meant to like JP's character, but... Kevin Barnhart just plays him with such a douchey charisma that you can't help but laugh at his antics. Thank you, Pinhead. Thank you. And it looks like the Hell Priest has finally awakened because we see several chains shoot out of various orifices in the statue, hooking themselves into the girl's skin and lifting her up. God damn. Well, I gotta admit it, this is a pretty gnarly death scene. Also, fun fact, the skinned version of the character is played by Paul Marshall, who is actually the same girl who plays Terry in this film. Also, we see the girl's face appear on the pillar after she gets absorbed into it, 
and Pinhead gets his pins back, signifying that the pillar has been absorbing souls into it for some time now, in preparation for Pinhead's rebirth. Jesus Christ! Not quite. And yeah, we also get that really neat one-liner from Pinhead. Although, it makes me wonder why they decided to change his voice in this movie, as it's not as deep or as authoritative as it was in the first two. You enjoyed the girl. Yes. Good. So did I. Ugh, you nasty, Pinhead. You may notice that Pinhead seems a lot more evil and chaotic this time around, and we'll get to the reason why later on, but it is also interesting to note that his character seems to be more like the devil this time around, in that he exploits other people through their desires in order to manipulate them into serving him. Here we see Pinhead tap into JP's desires, including his lust for women and sexual pleasure, as well as his desire for power. When JP threatens to shoot him, Pinhead is also able to identify the gun being used as the same one that was used to kill his parents in order for him to get their inheritance, insinuating that he is either able to read people's minds or may even be all-knowing. Their fortune was so tempting, their affection so conditional, what else could you do? Fuck you! Now. And we talk sensibly. Feeling completely bamboozled, JP falls to his knees and begins to cry. But it's okay, Pinhead is here to cheer him up with some friendly advice. If you have a quality, be proud of it. Let it define you, whatever it is. Well, alright. I guess we're being a little cryptid here, but hey, good advice is good advice. So Pinhead promises not only to spare JP, but also to make him his right-hand man, if JP is willing to help him by bringing him fresh souls to feed on, so that he can gain as much power as possible in order to grow a new body and escape from the Pillar. By the way, the Pillar is actually called the Pillar of Souls, which is a really sick name with a sick design that reminds me a lot of something H.R. Giger would create, with the various faces and markings etched into it. Although I do find it kind of odd that the pillar we saw at the end of Hellraiser 2, which is supposed to be the same one, was made of wood and was also composed of various moving parts and entities. Whereas here, it seems like it's completely solid and stationary with none of the faces moving. How do we start? It has already begun. Well, gee, that's helpful. Thanks, Pinhead. And now it's time for our special appearance by Ashley Lawrence as Kirsty, in which we see Joey watching the confessional footage of her, I guess, when she was in the Chenard Institute from the second film, in which she discusses her encounters with the Lament Configuration, the Cenobites, and the Labyrinth. <laughs> Can you turn that fucking thing off? Jesus Christ, I'm just making a YouTube video here. Unfortunately, her cameo is rudely interrupted, when Doug Bradley, minus his pinhead makeup, manages to find his way into Joey's TV. She's telling the truth, Joey. Meanwhile, back at the apartment, Terry notices the lament configuration, which is looking a lot shinier now, and begins to play with it. Fortunately for her, before she gets too far, a phone call interrupts her, which turns out to be none other than the douchebag man himself. It would appear as if he wants her back, but we all know that this is actually Pinhead manipulating him in order to get easy access to a fresh soul. After telling him to buzz off and hanging up the phone, the phone rings again, and a voicemail follows it shortly after from another news company that originally was supposed to be given a job to Terry, but it turns out this was actually a position that was intended for Joey, which Terry finds out and is understandably not very happy with her new friend. So she goes running back to JP. The two reconcile for a little while, and it seems like JP is about ready to sacrifice Terry to Pinhead, 
when all of a sudden we get another freaking dream scene. God, the pacing of this movie is all over the place. And this is coming from somebody who genuinely likes this film. At least this dream sequence is a little bit more entertaining and also serves to further the plot because all of a sudden we're transported from Vietnam way back to World War I where we meet Captain Elliot Spencer, aka Pinhead, before he became Pinhead. Joey, welcome. We check back in with JP and Terry at the Boiler Room Club, where we get to see the scariest part of this entire film, which is JP attempting to emote. And you know how sorry I am. I'm sorry to see you upset like this. We also get a nice little callback to the original film, where JP uses Frank's famous pickup line. Come to daddy. Terry tries to evade him, but it's too late. He grabs a hold of her and Pinhead wakes up, all growly and shouting. Kinda like me when I stub my toe. Bring that to me, boy! Do you have to be so condescending though, Pinhead? And it looks like JP has the upper hand until Terry whips out a set of brass knuckles. Wait! Why run, Terry? Why run? The fuck do you mean, why run? Well, for one, there's a talking statue that's speaking to me. How's that for starters? Unfortunately for her, Pinhead is just a little too smooth with his words, and she just happens to be a little bit too naive. He uses Terry's desires for dreams and, you know, not being homeless and stuff, as a way to manipulate her into sacrificing JP to him. We then get what's honestly a pretty neat little wide shot, showing the entire scale of the statue. Unfortunately, it goes on just a little too long as Terry struggles to push this man towards the pillar. <laughs> And this is just enough blood for Pinhead to be reborn as he blows his way out of the pillar. No, not like that, you sickos. We honestly get a pretty neat little light show here along with some interesting effects. Some of the early CGI doesn't look so great. However, the practical shots of the statue blowing up and crumbling apart don't look too bad at all. And now finally, almost a full 50 minutes into the movie, Pinhead is finally free from the pillar. And now, finally, we get into the meat and potatoes of this movie, when Joey is woken up in her apartment by the sound of music and a glowing light. She follows the music to find the radio that we saw at the beginning of Hellbound Hellraiser 2 in her closet. She plays around with it for a minute until a voice coming from the speaker tells her to go over to the window. She pulls back the curtain to reveal an all too familiar scene Straight out of the intro to Hellraiser 2, where we see Doug Bradley as Elliot Spencer, about to solve the lament configuration. Joey steps through the window in what is honestly a pretty cool little effect. Joey attempts to communicate with the seemingly unresponsive man in front of her, when a door with a really bright ass light shining through it opens up, beckoning her outside. As she makes her way across the abandoned battlefield with a lot of fucking dead bodies on it, she comes across the man again and is finally able to get a response from him. My name was Spencer. Elliot Spencer. Captain. So yeah, this is Captain Elliot Spencer, the human who would eventually become the Cenobite Pinhead when he discovers the Lament configuration shortly after World War I during his time in India. There is a really cool deleted scene that unfortunately I don't have since I have the theatrical release of the film as opposed to the uncut version, but it features a scene very reminiscent of when Frank bought the Lament configuration at the start of the first movie. 
in which we get to see Captain Spencer here purchasing the box from a similar looking merchant in a very similar looking market. <laughs> I found the monster within the box. It found the monster within me. And this is probably my favorite sequence in the entire film, if I'm being honest, as it does do a really effective job, in my opinion, of bridging the gap of the events between the first two films and this one. Also keeping us up to date on the Cenobite lore, as well as providing us an explanation for why Pinhead is more evil and malicious this time around. After turning good, briefly, at the end of Hellraiser 2, and being defeated by the Chenard Cenobite, along with the rest of his minions, Pinhead's soul was split into two separate entities, one being the human side of him, Elliot Spencer, which is the good part of Pinhead, that was basically put into limbo, and has been walking the earth restless ever since. The other half, which was the demonic side, got trapped in the Pillar of Souls that we saw at the end of the second film. Elliot does mention that Pinhead's evil was so strong, hence why, rather than perish like the rest of the Cenobites did, he only remained dormant until his reawakening, thanks to JP's assistance, as well as all of the souls that the Pillar had been absorbing over the years. I can only deduce that perhaps the statue went into a state of dormancy, hence why it solidified over the years. Spencer informs Joey that the only way to stop the newly freed and now unbound Pinhead from basically slaughtering and enslaving all of humanity is to lure him back to where Spencer is so that she can use the box on them after they become whole again and banish him back to hell once and for all. Though I can't imagine Leviathan would be too happy to see Pinhead, being that he's definitely fractured a law or two of the Cenobite Code at this point. He also provides her a little loophole in which as long as she does not give the box to Pinhead herself, he is unable to take it from her. Shall we begin? And begin we do as we get one of the largest body count scenes in any horror film I've ever seen. We also get a neat little cameo from Zach Galligan from Gremlins as he gets impaled against a wall by a pool stick. This poor woman gets a pinhead icicle through her mouth. All the while Pinhead stands there laughing maniacally. We also get some barbed wire around the face for our friendly bartender. This woman gets the flesh torn off her eyes. And this DJ gets a bunch of CDs embedded into his face. And what is a kind of goofy, but still rather gruesome kill. <laughs> yes, I agree. This scene is quite entertaining. The carnage continues as each and every one of our club members gets hooked. Haha, <laughs> see what I did there? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'd like to see you come up with a better pun. Also, we get a really dope-ass shot from the other side of the door, as pools of blood begin to puddle from underneath it. This is a really cool way of showing the carnage without giving away too much, while also leaving the rest up to the audience's imagination. Joey catches the news report of the Boiler Room Massacre on her TV, and then calls up Doc, who agrees to meet her there. During all this, Doc is flipping through the channels and we actually get a cool little cameo from the director of this film, Anthony Hickox. I love re-watching older films like this that I grew up with and catching these little easter eggs. Joey picks up the box and then amscrays out of her apartment. Not realizing that the TV has actually been unplugged this entire time. A trap, no doubt, set by Pinhead. Although this does make me question how Pinhead is even aware of Joey's existence at this point, considering that the two have yet to come in contact with one another. Unless, like I said earlier, he is just simply all-knowing, or perhaps he has some type of telepathic connection with Spencer, whom is assisting her in this quest. Joey comes across the club, which seems a lot less lively now, along with Doc's seemingly abandoned vehicle. She goes inside to investigate and finds mountains and mountains of dead bodies, and some gruesome, 
goofy, and rather creative kills, all wrapped up into one little package. I always do get a kick, though, out of the brain in the blender, as well as the guy with the cue balls shoved into his mouth. We also get a pretty gnarly shot of this guy, who looks like he was turned into a Christmas ornament. And finally, Joey comes across her old friend, Doc, who has now been turned into a literal cameraman. Alright, alright, I'll stop. Pinhead comes along and starts monologuing, as Pinhead does, about his plans for humanity, the destruction of the Earth, and razors through flesh. You know, typical bad guy stuff. By the way, who lit all these candles? Was it Pinhead? And if so, why? Did Bath and Body Works have a sale and he just couldn't resist? Pinhead tries to tempt her into giving him the box, but when she refuses, he starts throwing a temper tantrum like a two-year-old from hell. Don't debate with me, girl! Just come here and die while you still have the option of doing it quickly! One of the biggest complaints about this film from fans who only enjoy the first two movies is that Pinhead talks too much. I honestly don't see this as an issue, I mean, it makes sense that he'd be more chatty as well as more maniacal and chaotic this time around, considering that this Pinhead is pure evil and does not have the human side to keep him in check. The character we saw in the first two movies was evil, yes, but he was bound by laws. As Elliot Spencer put it earlier in this movie, Hell has its commandments too. This isn't the same neutral demon we saw in the first two. This Pinhead is no longer bound by the Cenobite Code and is free to do whatever he wishes and kill whomever he kills regardless of the Cenobite rules. So Pinhead tries to grab the box but it zaps him and Joey is able to escape. She finds herself back on the streets where it seems like everything in New York City is trying to kill her. Starting with this taxi driver, and then some downed cables that come alive and try to shock her. Ouchie. We also get an exploding fire hydrant in a nice little lightning show. And you can't forget about the hooks. Joey gets hooked but manages to escape as the entire city around here seems to be exploding and catching fire. After nearly getting decapitated by a flying manhole, she is finally able to find some peace and quiet next to this TV shop. But oh boy is she in for a surprise now, as it looks like Doc is back and he's been given a serious makeover. We also get a good look at the prosthetic used, which is actually pretty well done. What do you have to say about all this, Doc? Have you seen what he did to me, you little bitch? Have you seen? Ugh, rude. So, Doc can apparently now create explosions using the flash of the camera that's embedded into his skull, as well as use it to give people lobotomies, as seen here when he kills this random hippie dude. Whoa, what the f <laughs> Ready for your close up, Joey? He also spouts off some pretty bad puns, but at least there's only a few of them that we have to listen to. Joey rounds a corner and runs into Pinhead again, as well as one of his other newly created Cenobites, the CD Cenobite, which was previously the DJ we saw in the club, who, in addition to having CDs embedded into his skull, is able to throw them like ninja stars. I know, I know, it's a little silly, but, you know, this is why I consider this movie can't be fun. Last but not least, we have my favorite of the bunch, the Barbie Cenobite, called so because he has barbed wire wrapped around his face. He also is literally a human blowtorch and can breathe fire, which is pretty dope. The Barbie Cenobite was also played by Peter Atkins, who played the bartender character. Oh good, the cops finally showed up. Okay, well I guess win some, lose some, but I'm sure they're equipped to handle this situation. Also, what is admittedly pretty neat is that the Barbie Cenobite has a drink mixer he carries with him that is filled with gasoline. Shit! Gasoline! That's what I said. Run! So the cops get blown to smithereens in a pretty neat little stunt. And camera head Cenobite gives us another banner. 
That's a wrap. Man, he just keeps dropping those bars. Joey stumbles across a church and probably figuring that this is a holy place and the Cenobites cannot enter it. She decides to go in, fall onto her knees, she comes across a priest who has some rather weird confessions regarding demons. Demons? Demons aren't real? They're parables, metaphors. Well, thanks for your help, buddy. However, this does give us what is, in my opinion, one of the greatest scenes of all time from any of the Hellraiser films. Then what the fuck is that? And I just love this badass shot of Pinhead entering the church as he begins to wreck it and we hear Christopher Young's awesome score from Hellbound which would become synonymous with the Pinhead character in this film as well as the next one. Sadly, copyright is a bitch, so I can't play it. How dare you! Thou shalt not bow down before any graven image. <laughs> Man, Pinhead's a dick in this movie. So after melting the priest's cross and destroying the podium, Pinhead pulls a few pins out of his head along with these worm looking things that are apparently attached to them. He then gives himself stigmata, mocking Christ, and giving us one of the coolest pinhead moments in all of the Hellraiser franchise. Apparently, Anthony Hickox and the rest of his crew had a bitch of a time finding a church that would allow them to film such a scene, which is pretty understandable, given the circumstances and the nature of this scene. That being said though, they eventually had to build a set that looked like a church. Anyway, so the priest snaps and decides to charge right up to the Cenobite. Bird of such a limited imagination. Apparently, there is supposed to be a undertone of homoeroticism in this scene, where Pinhead feeds a piece of himself to the priest while quoting the Bible again. I'm personally not religious and I'm not too familiar with a lot of these stories and quotes from the Bible, so perhaps somebody else can fill me in on this. So Joey is able to distract Pinhead using the box, saving the priest's life just in the nick of time, before running off to a construction site. Is it me or is this starting to feel like a video game? Here we get to meet our last two Cenobites for this film. There's Piston Head, aka JP who is literally getting his brain screwed out every second of every day. You know, kind of like human JP did. And then we also get the Dreamer Cenobite, aka Terry. Both are played by their same human actors, Paula Marshall and Kevin Bernhardt. And aw, don't cry, Joey. Piston Head's here to calm you down. Relax, baby. This is better than sex. All right, or just act like a creep, I guess. Pinhead shows up to taunt Joey, explaining to her that the newly created Cenobites are the shadow of his former troops. Personally, I don't think they hold a candle to the OG Cenobites, and honestly, I wish they hadn't brought the other three back for this film, even if they wanted to include these new ones as well. I don't hate the Hellraiser 3 Cenobites, I actually rather do appreciate the designs and the prosthetic effects used to bring them to life. But I can see why some folks are not that fond of them. Also, Joey totally roasts Pinhead here. Play with this Pinhead! That look totally says, I fucking hate when people call me that. Fun fact, this is the first time and to my knowledge the only time we ever hear the character's name addressed as Pinhead in any of the films. At least by one of the characters. So Joey manages to solve the Lament configuration similar to how Kirsty did in the first movie, which banishes all of the pseudo Cenobites, called so because they are created by another Cenobite, versus the Dark God Leviathan himself, back to hell. The blue laser that shoots out of the box zaps Pinhead as well, and we see him disappear. However, it's not confirmed yet if he's actually dead or not. Let's stay tuned and find out. All seems well, but then we're suddenly transported into a random field, which turns out to be the one from Joey's dreams about her dead father in Vietnam. 
And who should show up but the man himself? Of course, you know, being not the brightest bulb in the box, Joey immediately falls for this and thinks there is nothing strange at all about her dead father that she never met popping up to greet her. I mean, granted, there's been a lot of freaky supernatural shit happening up to this point, so perhaps he just feels like this is par for the course. But still, I would expect her to have a little more common sense at this point. Joey's father informs her that she has something for him that she will no longer need. And of course, putting two and two together, she hands him the lament configuration without a second's hesitation. But surprise, surprise, it's not really her dad. How did you know my name? Thank you, Joey. So Pinhead taunts her for being so gullible, which hey, can't say I blame him. And is it just me or is it really weird seeing Pinhead in broad daylight like this? Also, what's even more strange is apparently we're playing by Nightmare on Elm Street rules now because Pinhead is able to invade Joey's dreams using the memories she has of her dead father. But it was all a trap set by Spencer because just as Pinhead's about to kill Joey, we're suddenly transported back to the hut we saw earlier. Couldn't resist playing games, could you? Now, we're going to hell. Ladies first. So Pinhead chains up Joey and then taunts Spencer some in a bunch of really weird and creepy close-up angles. All the while cackling like a little schoolgirl. Then this weird fucking thing pops out of the ground. Kinda looks like something out of Alien. I'm not sure if Pinhead's plan here is to turn Joey into another Cenobite, or simply to just torture her. Anyway, Spencer comes to the realization that he is what made Pinhead after all due to his own selfish desires and lust for pleasures. So he decides to join up with him. But just kidding, it was all a facade as he grabs the box from Pinhead which frees Joey, and then Pinhead and Spencer straight up get into a WWE match. <laughs> then their heads begin to stretch until they conjoin into one another, and we get a mixture of some pretty cool practical effects and some very early 90s CGI, which admittedly doesn't look that great. Pinhead absorbs Spencer, and it looks like he has won this fight, but Spencer is still alive and well deep within Pinhead's body. He's able to overpower him temporarily, which buys Joey enough time to solve the Lament configuration once again. She begins to play with the box, transforming it into the Leviathan configuration which we saw in the second film, then stabs Pinhead in the chest which makes him shrink I guess and then disappear. I don't know, it's a little confusing. Anyway, the now whole Cenobite is sent back to hell. Go to hell. <laughs> Through some interesting special effects, and then we are transported back to the construction site. With Pinhead defeated, at least temporarily, and peace restored to humanity, Joey takes the Lament configuration and buries it deep within the cement of this construction site, in the hopes that nobody will ever discover it. However, as we'll find out in the next film, Hellraiser Bloodline, this is not the case. Sometime later, we transition to another shot as the camera pans up, and we see now the completed building that has taken on the designs of the Lament configuration, implying that the supernatural and evil powers of the box have lived on in the form of this building. The final shot shows us the walls of the building are covered with the Lament configuration markings, as we hear the sound of a door slamming shut and are treated to the sound of Hellraiser by Motorhead, an awesome fucking song, which was also done by Ozzy Osbourne, that I highly recommend checking out if you have not listened to it. 
I even more so recommend checking out the music video that was made for this film, which features the Hell Priest himself, played once again by Doug Bradley, playing cards against Lemmy from Motorhead. It's a pretty sick video and honestly not a bad song at all. Especially if you enjoy heavy metal music. So that was Hellraiser 3 Hell on Earth from 1992 and it's honestly not nearly as bad as a lot of people say. I mean, overall I know it's a pretty 50-50 split amongst the fan base. Like I said, people either love this one or they hate it. I'm perfectly willing to acknowledge that yes, the acting from the supporting cast is not the greatest. The characters are not particularly interesting aside from Elliot Spencer slash Pinhead. And yes, the pseudo Cenobites and some of the death scenes are a little on the goofy side. But good, clean, campy fun is the best way to sum up this movie. It does definitely take a more slasher-esque approach, however, it still retains enough of the same themes as well as the music from the previous two movies to where it feels like enough of a Hellraiser movie to be considered a sequel. Randy Miller would do the score this time around, taking over for Christopher Young who did the first two movies. However, in spite of this, we hear Christopher Young's tracks from both the first and second Hellraiser movies played throughout this film. On one hand, yes, the score to this film is not the most original as most of it is just recycled music from the previous two movies, but I just love Christopher Young's music so freaking much, so I'm not going to complain about it. It's sort of like the Axel Foley theme from Beverly Hills Cop, no matter how many times it plays throughout the movie, you just never get tired of hearing it. While not as gory as Hellbound, there is still plenty of gruesome deaths to go around, and this film will definitely satisfy most gore hounds. Like I said earlier, a few of the kills are a little on the silly side, but I will give them props for being inventive and very creative with these death scenes. The biggest issue with the film for me personally is actually not the storyline, but is rather the build up in the first half. I mean, I don't have anything against a slow burning movie, I think it's actually good to do a build up and develop your characters, develop your world, and build that anticipation so that you can have a payoff for your audience later on. But that's the thing, the payoff has to be worth it, and while the club scene is really freaking cool, and definitely is where the action really takes off in this movie for me. I still feel like the build up in the first 50 minutes of the movie are just a little bit too slow paced and it goes on for a little too long. It does feel like that second dream sequence could have been trimmed out or somehow spliced together with the third one in which Joey finally meets Elliot Spencer whom tells her the story of how he became Pinhead. Aside from the few bits of Hellraiser lore we get here and there, along with the pinhead and lament configuration that we see in the first half of this movie, it kind of feels like you're watching a soap opera in a way with all the drama. This next point is not necessarily a direct criticism of this movie, but it does seem odd that a lot of the dialogue between Joey and Pinhead, especially in the film's climax, Seems like it was a lot more geared towards Ashley Lawrence's character, Kirstie, from the first two movies. This would have made a lot more sense to have her come back, being that these two characters have history together, but shit happens. Unfortunately, with respect to Terry Farrell, Joey just is not that interesting of a character. There really isn't a whole lot for us to get invested in besides maybe the death of her father and her desires to find out about him, but even that is handled in not the most interesting way. And like I said, her acting is just, it's not the best and it's pretty clear that this was one of her first film roles. Thankfully her performances would improve later on with some of the TV stuff that she did, again going back to Deep Space Nine. Unfortunately, the only characters that are really all that interesting besides Pinhead and Elliot Spencer would probably be Terry and maybe JP, even though he's supposed to be the superficial douchebag of the movie. 
I do rather enjoy Kevin Bernhardt's over-the-top douchey performance, both as a human as well as a Cenobite. Unfortunately, it seems like Doug Bradley is really the one that carries this film as Pinhead. I mean, he is the main reason why most fans were probably seeing this film, considering that Julia Cotton from the first two movies was originally intended to be the main villain for this movie as well as for the rest of the franchise. However, fans didn't really seem all that invested in her and while I did enjoy her in those first two movies, I don't think it would have really been in the best interest of the franchise if she had become the icon versus pinhead. So I do think that the writers and the studio and everybody made the proper decision by making Pinhead the main character of this movie and the icon of the franchise going forward. Upon my recent rewatch of this movie, I did notice a few more flaws and things that kind of stuck out. But overall, I still quite enjoy it and get a lot of fun out of it. I would say this is probably my fourth favorite Hellraiser film. Maybe my third, it's kind of a toss up between this one and Bloodline for third or fourth place. Hellbound is definitely my favorite. Of course the original is a classic and that's a close follow up. Then it's either Hellraiser 4 or Hellraiser 3. Bloodline, which I'll get to in my next video, is a little bit more structured in terms of story and characters. But it's an absolute clusterfuck of a mess due to some serious studio interference and the director quit in with the movie getting an Alan Smithy credit instead. This movie, while messy and a little bit light on the story elements, is a lot more fun in my opinion. So let me know guys, what is your favorite Hellraiser movie and where does this third film stack up in your overall rankings of this entire franchise? Let me know in the comments down below. I would really like to know. Alright guys, well that's a wrap on this episode. Please, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to leave a comment, like, subscribe so you don't miss out on more content. Check out that Patreon. I'm going to post a link to that in the description below. There you'll find all kinds of cool perks, including early access and exclusive content only found over there. I know I've been slacking a little bit on the, uh, excuse me, on the Patreon page, guys. I'm going to get back on it soon. Um, I've just found it to be a little easier for now to upload on YouTube. But there's going to be more stuff on Patreon. I'm putting that up for sure. Um, I want to give you guys as much as I possibly can, um, considering all the, the support and all the help that you guys have been to me. Uh, so definitely go check that out. Um, if not, no problem at all. You can find everything here on YouTube, even though it might take a little longer sometimes for me to upload it. But regardless, guys, appreciate all your support. And um, yeah, that's a wrap on this one. Ciao for now, folks.